Hello everybody, this is Dr. Jamie Marich, and once again, happy Recovery Month 2021. And it's my great pleasure to be joined by a very special guest for this interview, and it just happens to be wonderful that it's in this month of September that we celebrate recovery. Of course, I think every day we should celebrate it, yet I know it's nice to have this attention paid in September. So joining me today is Dr. Lisa Najewicz who is the developer of the Seeking Safety curriculum and program that is well known to so many of us in the field. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning of Trauma and the 12 Steps, I consider Dr. Najewicz amongst many others who have inspired me as true legends in this field, especially as women who identified a need that was not being met in either traditional treatment or traditional 12 step. And I'm excited to talk with her today about how that developed and, and the genesis. So uh, Dr. Lisa, hello. Thank you so much, Jamie. So let's get started by uh, learning a little bit about you and how you got into really doing this work of working with trauma and addiction and helping others heal. Yeah, and I have to say, when I began in the early 90s, it was just the emergence of a focus on uh, what was then called dual diagnosis, what we now call co-occurring disorders. And since then, there has been so much amazing work by so many different people, including you. And so the genesis of Seeking Safety really began with the emergence, I think, of a growing awareness at that point of how so many people with addiction do have trauma. It is the, the default narrative, unfortunately, of course. And so when I was looking at just starting my career, doing my first grant, working on my first set of publications, it occurred to me that trauma had just really not been tapped as an important issue. Trauma, PTSD, and all the related conditions that go with that. And so I was very heartened uh, to find that uh, the National Institute on Drug Abuse funded my first grant, which was a pilot project to develop what became Seeking Safety. And it has just been a wild ride over these many years in the best sense, really uh, launching me to have amazing conversations with so many different people in this area of work, providers, program directors, and of course, people themselves who have lived with these issues. So how did the name Seeking Safety specifically come about for the program? Yeah, interesting. So essentially what had happened was I had developed the model, but it didn't yet have a title. And I was having a conversation with my husband who said, well, what do you think is the main theme across everything? And I thought, yeah, let me, let me really hone in on that. Um, because it was very much sort of a, a bottom up sort of method of writing and developing it, just trying to notice themes as I was listening to people I worked with and reading and so on. At any rate, and that conversation in the car with my husband, it occurred to me, safety. So needless to say, of course, I also, probably at some unconscious level, um, hearken back to the book by Judith Herman, the amazing, eloquent, now classic book in the field called Trauma and Recovery, in which she identifies safety as the first stage in healing. But uh, ironically, it wasn't at least in direct consciousness at the time. But then when I sort of connected the dots, it was a perfect, perfect um, focus. So thus the name. Um, and uh, I really have to say, I uh, value enormously that concept of safety. I think it just has layers of meaning and depths that throughout our lives, throughout everyone's life is always a focus. Let's go there about the, the layers and the depth and the meaning, because people who follow my work know that I, I have a complicated relationship with the English word safety. Um, and, and it's not so much the word, because obviously I value what it means to find safety within myself, safety in my body. I, I just think it's it's more of a nuanced construct for me than just I'm safe or I'm not in any given situation. 
Uh, and that's me and, and my journey. And I often say different survivors have different definitions. So let, let's talk a bit about that nuance. Maybe what does safety mean for you? And then how is it explored or defined in the program? Yeah, definitely. And I appreciate that it is not a simple binary yes, no, on off switch by any means. And sometimes unsafe moments lead to greater safety and so on. So it is complex. I think um, for me personally, uh, it's probably pretty, how would I put it, pretty common um, that I think many, many people would share that uh, it's some of the things you just mentioned, safety in one's body, uh, safety in terms of relationships. And I would also say that it expands out. And when I think about trauma and of course addiction as well, uh, which is a key focus for us here today. I think of how it also ripples out into families and neighborhoods and peers and communities and culture, and at some level globally. So when I think of safety, it's this layered idea of the different ways that we're individuals, of course, but also we are so connected in all these different ways. And if safety does not exist at some levels, it will impact all the others. So I think people just have their own way of moving into different layers of it, uh, different ripples of the concept of safety. And any path into safety is good and people do it in different ways. Some people become really uh, strong advocates to help other survivors and that builds their own safety as well as the safety of the people they're helping. Certainly that's been a huge part of the 12-step movement that by helping others one builds one's own recovery as well. So long story short, I think uh, safety uh, it, it's a beautiful concept and it can be approached in many different ways. Uh, coming back to seeking safety and what it means there, it's defined there in a fairly straightforward way, which is helping the people who are doing the recovery work think for themselves. And it really is through the lens of their own experience, their own eyes. Is this thing right now safe or unsafe? Thing being a relationship they're in, an action they're taking, a thought they're having. And for different people, it really varies. And so what's safe for one person may not be for another, but it's just each person coming into their own awareness of what is safe for them. And we do think about it in cognitive, behavioral, and interpersonal ways, cognitive being thinking, beh uh, behavioral being action, and interpersonal being relationships. So for people not familiar with the curriculum itself, and I know this is your life's work and you've done days long training courses on this, so I, I definitely don't expect everything to be covered, but in, in summary form, um, how does the curriculum, how is it structured? How does Seeking Safety specifically as a program work? Yeah, so basically it's a structured curriculum, treatment manual, that can be done by anybody. It was really designed from a public health standpoint to be accessible, to be extremely low cost. Uh, the only thing needed is a copy of the book and that's it. Mm -hmm. uh, training is available, but never required. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it was, uh, I'm happy to say over these many years, it has been found very, very safe. We don't hear of adverse events or, um, people getting triggered in ways that um, are from the curriculum itself. So the bottom line is, what is the model? Um, it's 25 different topics, meaning 25 different chapters. Each one is a safe coping skill that addresses both trauma and addiction if both are present. Mm -hmm. If someone has just one issue or just the other, it can get applied to either or. And also more broadly, we try to think of the whole person, that these skills, which I'll name in a moment, can be applied to whatever is currently going on in that person's life. And we certainly know that aside from trauma and addiction, and certainly connected to it, there are many, many different things. Homelessness, 
job loss, uh, relationship problems, et cetera, et cetera, physical issues and so on. So the whole person walks in the room and in Seeking Safety, we try to help take these 25 different skills and apply it toward that. So what are examples? Asking for help, setting boundaries in relationships, coping with triggers, creating meaning, honesty, compassion, taking good care of yourself, integrating the split self, and on and on. And really, the core message is, aside from any of these particular skills, we're trying to build the concept that safety is a very creative act. It's actually endless numbers of skills. There are millions of ways of coping safely, and it's up to each person to figure out what that is for them. And I think that's one of the the joys of doing this work, whether with Seeking Safety or any other model people use, that it's a process of awakening different ideas about what can work for that person at that moment in their lives. And I adore that statement that safety is a very creative act because as an expressive arts person who's really into creativity, so much of that is about personal empowerment and variation and yes even as you were naming the different skills i'm thinking there are so many different ways to to get there for different people depending on context and i've, and I've always liked that there's that openness uh, so yeah uh, thank you for that and and the the idea of of it always being available as something that's low cost is another aspect of this program and this work that has super impressed me so tell me a little bit about uh, your passion and your direction for making this as widely available as possible. Yeah, well, one thing we know is that most people who have trauma, most people who have addiction do not end up in professional care yeah. for a whole lot of reasons. And so when I was developing Seeking Safety, my key goal was A, how to make it safe uh, for everyone involved, safety in the room, safety for the participants, safety for the providers. And so the goal was to focus just on the present. So that was the key idea that we want to move into really talking about trauma. Uh, for a long time, of course, trauma had been almost a taboo topic in terms of addiction treatment. Mm -hmm. um, and for good reason. Uh, basically, the idea was you didn't want to sort of open up Pandora's box with a lot of painful memories and emotions that the person wasn't prepared to handle. Mm -hmm. So when I got this grant to develop a model to address trauma and addiction at the same time, uh, the the way I went about it was, well, let's just stay in the present. Mm -hmm. And so uh, basically, uh, we that's what we do um, in this model. Sure. And uh, I could go on and on, but I'll pause there. <laughs> And, and what I like about it is even, it, I shouldn't say like qualifying it, as a present focus model, I do like that it teaches people how to stay more in the present. Because one of my enduring criticisms of 12 step, even though, as you know, I'm fundamentally pro 12 step, it just has needed to be <laughs> made more trauma informed, is that we tell people stay in the present, but don't give them skills for how to do it. And this is where I think the, the skills of seeking safety are, are, are invaluable uh, for folks. Now, the, the larger conversation here, and I know you and I have talked about this outside of this interview, and, and I really want to hear what you have to say here from the perspective of the literature and your experience, is this, this kind of debate that can ensue, especially in the trauma field, on, on the trauma addiction side of things about present focused versus does treatment really need to go to the past? and involve extensive reprocessing. And I think there are some people who look at present focused treatment and will say, well, it's a band-aid, it's harm reduction. And I know there's others who say, but it work, it can work for, for different people. So based on your experience and your knowledge of the literature, how do you weigh in on that debate? Can we just keep people in the present or is it imperative we take them to the past? Yeah, you just asked the essential question in this area of work. And what has emerged over these decades is really interesting and often very counterintuitive. 
So there are a couple bullet points uh, I'll highlight here. And there is now a much broader literature than, than used to exist. There have been quite a lot of studies, a lot of uh, really just getting to know uh, the, the people involved in this, what, what clients are experiencing, what their preferences are, et cetera, et cetera. So the bullet points, the first one is that when looking at people who have both current significant trauma symptoms, I'll say PTSD for shorthand, but there are different versions of symptom clusters we could talk about, but let's just say PTSD and current substance use disorder, which is the most commonly studied addiction. Uh, just to highlight as a side point, we also want to, of course, also definitely pay attention to the often less attended to behavioral addictions, things like gambling, excessive eating, internet, pornography, etc. Um, but substance use has been the most studied one. So first bullet point is when you look at studies of people who have current active PTSD, current active substance abuse, and you directly compare models that focus on the present, seeking safety be one, one example and the most studied one of those, versus models that focus on the past, and there are many amazing models, um, EMDER being one of them, that is one of my absolute favorites, uh, as I know it is uh, yours, Jamie, you've done amazing work writing about that and doing a lot in that area. Um, and there are certainly many other models as well, various versions of exposure therapy and narrative exposure and written exposures, et cetera, et cetera. But broad categorizations. The bottom line is what you find, and it's quite surprising, is that past focus models do not outperform present focus models when looking at this population of people with PTSD and substance abuse. The second bullet point I'll say is also very surprising. And that is that models that are integrated, meaning they address both PTSD and substance abuse at the same time versus models that are for just one or just the other, just PTSD or just substance abuse, you would think that integrated models would do better than single models, but in fact, they don't for the most part. Uh, what you find is that if you take an addiction model uh, and compare it to an integrated model, often the uh, single model does just as well. So that's surprising too. Basically, we don't have what you might call precision medicine in right. the area of uh, counseling or in the area of helping. So I think the, the key takeaway from those two bullet points is there are many, many different approaches and each person, you used a beautiful word a few moments ago, Jamie, empowerment. Each person should pick what works for them, but not to feel that there is pressure to go back into the trauma story if they don't want to, or if they've done it and they didn't find it helpful. I am a huge fan of past focus models of all kinds um, when it's the right person and with someone who uh, is can deliver it in a, in a good way and right. someone wants to do that work, but not to feel that it's imposed or that sometimes people get this really damaging message that, well, they won't recover if they don't move into that trauma narrative. And we certainly know that's not true. Even in the PTSD alone literature, we know that that's not true. Yeah, beautifully summarized. And is there any nuance either in the literature or in your professional experience, which I consider to be very valuable here, any nuance around what is often called complex PTSD or dissociative disorders, which we know typically have their origin in some kind of traumatic experience? So that's really interesting. And that certainly is important to focus on. Um, you know, so far, I will say the studies in the area of PTSD and substance abuse have predominantly had people with complex PTSD. The general treatment literature on PTSD, I think, has been more broad, uh, just because there have been far more studies and it's gone on for a longer uh, number of years. In general, I think the same principles hold that it's all the maybe we could even say all the more important that people who have suffered so much with that early, repeated, very damaging, severe kinds of trauma, that they feel empowered to pick what works for them. And 
again, I just to be super clear, I am a huge fan of past focused trauma models. I think they are enormously important and enormously helpful to a lot of people. I've also heard stories from patients who have said they went to therapy to try to work on their PTSD and they were told they had to tell their story or they wouldn't recover or, you know, messages that then they left treatment for, for many, many years. Um, or they felt they started to tell their story and they couldn't handle it and that they weren't strong enough and they turned against themselves and they didn't return. So I think sometimes we don't see you know, the people who don't return or the people who don't show up because they're afraid of yeah. having to do work when they're there are many different approaches. So the, the phrase I love, I believe it's a Chinese phrase, let a thousand flowers bloom. There are just so many different ways. Yes, that's, that's a fine summary on what we've been talking about for sure. And yeah, as you were talking, I was really taken back to days of working and treatment where there was essentially a lot of a force fifth step, even though it wasn't technically a fifth step because it was treatment and not 12 step. When a lot of treatment centers can be so influenced by old school 12 step, there can be that, well, you have to talk about it. Your secrets keep you sick. And, you know, I take on a lot of that in my work that, um, especially when that rhetoric is being delivered by people who don't even know how to take people there, <laughs> that's concerning to me. And, uh, you, you've just really helped to, to clarify a lot of the nuance here today, which, which I think is, is beautiful. And the more and more I've been in this field, I think with every year I've been in this field every year in my recovery, I've really come to embrace this phrase of both and. And for, for so many of us, it, it does involve that past oriented treatment, albeit I know for me, and this is purely my experience, it's never involved getting so wrapped up in a trauma narrative. It's you know, more about getting present in the body and the feelings and expressing. Yet uh, there are different paths. And I, I think one of the greatest things we have to do as treatment providers, as sponsors, as peers, as advocates is not imposing our way on people, right? And embracing the variation. Uh, so thank you, uh, Dr. Lisa, for being here today. Oh, and thank you, Dr. Jamie, uh, for all the work you do and a pleasure. Any, any final thoughts, anything uh, we left uncovered? No, I think we touched on a lot of really wonderful themes. And I just want to conclude by, by punctuating. I know I mentioned this briefly at the beginning, and I, I have a line to this effect in, in Trauma and the 12 Steps that for me, and, and I, I'm sure I'm inevitably going to leave someone off the list because I'm kind of going on the fly here. I consider people like you, Judith Herman, who you mentioned, Stephanie Covington, Chris Courtois, and their related colleagues, uh, Tian Dayton, as some of the people we really need to be reading now. Because uh, it's clear that a lot of your work got attention in the 90s, and there have been a lot of, oh, just different books and different scholarship paths that have risen on trauma. But I, I just think there's so much significance that you as female leaders in the field were really some of the first to identify the issues at, at hand. And I just want to thank you for being a trailblazer in that area. Well, thank you. So, uh, Dr. Lisa, where can people find out more either about you or the Seeking Safety program, your trainings, your studies online? Yeah, um, so there's a website. Um, it, certainly, if people just Google Seeking Safety, they'll get to it. And I'll just mention that there will be a revised edition of Seeking Safety within the next few years that is long overdue. In the meantime, um, as part of my really uh, central public health focus, I actually came out with a more recent book called Finding Your Best Self, which came out in 2019 and can be done as self-help. It can be done by anyone, family, peers, providers of all kinds. And that one is also much less expensive than Seeking Safety. I don't set the prices on these. I'm never trying to sell these books, but I just mention it because I'm, I, I always wanna be very sensitive to there are so many different situations people have. So um, both of those books are described on the website. And so if you Google Seeking Safety, you'll find out uh, about those and 
a lot else that may be of interest. There's a lot of also uh, literature on PTSD, substance abuse, research, a lot of, we have a section library that has a lot of articles. So if, if we can be of help, we are happy to. It also has my contact info. Wonderful. Thank you so much again for being here with us. And this interview that you're listening to will be posted on YouTube, on Facebook page uh, for Dr. Jamie Marich for the Institute for Creative Mindfulness. And please feel free to share this on because I believe this is important information to have out there uh, as we continue to look at solutions for the crisis of trauma and addictions interplay. Thank you everybody for joining us.